Hey guys, this is Coach Kita Bussey with 180 Firearms Training, joined by Grant Chancellor Madison from South Africa and Chris Tilly. Welcome to the 180 Firearms Training Podcast. <laughs> So Chris, I understand that you started shooting at a very young age, you about 12 or so. Uh, the competition side, let's see, it was, uh, it was the summer of 96. So I was 11. Okay. Wow. And you had your own coaches, if I understand correctly. Yeah. You know, my, um, uh, my parents uh, were all for it, but they really didn't. They, they were in the industry of uh, like hobby, like as a side business selling and buying guns and such, uh, having an indoor range, but they weren't really into it. But one of the employees that they hired were, and yeah, they, he, he, he got me in full bore and uh, never looked back. So what, what kind of people were coaching you? What was your coaching like? Uh, at the beginning, it was like everybody, you know, how to make it through the match, how to get this disqualified, uh, the safety stuff, proper movement without, you know, breaking the 180. Uh, but as far as there was also other things there, and a lot of it came from the tactical standpoint. Uh, this this guy, his name is Kaz Castagnotti. He's actually still in the game uh, training and such like that, but mainly uh, defensive and that's, 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 that's really where a lot of the training came from was military, what he's learned from classes that the military sent him uh, and such of that. So it really wasn't geared towards competition. Oh, that's interesting. But you got very good, very fast, and you were very competitive at a super young age. When did you win your first title? Oof, the, like uh, in, any title. So my first major match win, I want to believe it was uh, Georgia State. And it's actually, uh, it, it, it was something that, I, it wasn't that big of a deal to me then. Now, now I look back and there's about three or four matches when I was pretty young that I won that, you know, really mean a lot to me. And that is definitely one of them. And I, and I think it was Georgia State where uh, uh, Bill Drummond actually was also shooting and he was second. And uh, there was a little bit of drama that happened there and uh, it kind of kick-started our, our relationship together as well. He took a break after that match for a while since uh, oh. I want to say, how old was I? A 16 year old or 15 year old kid beat him. <laughs> yeah. And now that's kind of starting all over. You were probably one of the first junior guys to really start cleaning house. And now we're seeing it all the time. All these junior yep. shooters are sort of standing on the shoulders of giants because they have access to the YouTube videos and things like that, that yes. you never had that i mean you that's that's hitting the nail on the head right that's that's exactly what's going on i mean it's it's incredible to watch it it's it's frustrating in one sense because they don't have to put as much work in in my mind whether that's true or not i don't know but in my mind it's true um you know where i had to go i had to go to the match and i had to film these guys i had to i had to go and you know bother jerry barnhart and watch him and spend hours on the range watching him when i wasn't shooting just to you know see how he would come in a position or lead position or you know, where the gun was, you know, all these small details that most people don't pay attention to. I, I had to learn how to look for that first on my own and, uh, you know, start kind of building up from there, the small details. But I, I had to, I, I'm going to kind of go back a, a step here. I had another really good coach, Larry Brown, that uh, got me started, who really was more detailed and sport oriented that I worked with a lot. And he he's really the main reason how I knew what to look for to get better. So I, I give a lot of a lot of credit to him for sure. So what did you look for? You know, it was just figuring out, like, if I took the, the, the top 10 guys in the super squad that I thought had good runs and figuring out why they were good runs, what separated them apart from, from the others? You know, was it footwork? Was it how the gun was moving? Was it just their feet? You know, did they move less? Did the gun move less? Was it their technique of, you know, how they're holding the gun so their splits and transitions were quicker? Things of that nature. So once I found that, and then I'd break it down even more, what are they doing different? You know, and, and very, very simply just breaking it down from this course of uh, uh, whatever it may be that caught my attention that possibly could be better that separated them and then breaking it down to figuring out what it actually was. Okay, so you were learning from their, from their successes, basically, by video Abs taping. Absolutely. You know, and it's funny, one of the first years that I really remember putting, putting my work in, uh, you know, on the ground at the matches like that was uh, – it was 1999 in Barry, Illinois, and I was definitely shooting on the opposite opposite schedule of the Super Squad on purpose. And uh, Eric Rafael was there. His first time I actually met Eric was in 99, and uh, he didn't. He, he, let's just say he was very 
uh, very much the culture of a French guy. Like uh, he'd just pee, <laughs> pee, he'd pee anywhere. I remember we're watching him and all of a sudden he just turns around and starts peeing with all these people. It's like, what in the world's going on here? You know, he's a young guy too. And uh, I know that's kind of a weird thing to remember that, but that was the, it was so it's weird. So jumped out. Somebody just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, you know, there's this shooter that no one really knows that's, you know, kind of getting a lot of attention because he's, I think he ended up being third or fourth at the match. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Rob won and then it was Todd, then Jerry and then Eric. But it was very impressive that this this guy that nobody knew, you know, who, that ended up becoming the, you know, the greatest of all time in our sport, you know, come to the U.S. and getting his feet wet like that. And uh, that was that was a big dis- a big thing for me to see, though because of the filming and watching why he was so good was how he moved, how he kept flowing through positions where mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of the good shooters, like I remember Todd was really good about getting in a position, setting up, that would be a static position and then mm-hmm. getting out of position. And one thing that made him really, really good, Eric, that is this, this, his ability to move and shoot on targets that most people would not even dare, you know, a partial yeah. 15 yards, you'd move and shoot on it. These guys wouldn't. You know, the only guy that was close to that kind of rolling through positions and moving and shooting like that at the time was really Jerry. But uh, it, it, there was definitely there was definitely still a lot more static and stopped positions there. And that that was really the first match that I went to and started putting pieces together as far as what I'm doing, and what I need to be doing. And just just in big course moments of whether it's movement or tactics on the stage or fundamentals of shooting the gun. And breaking it down like that uh, over all the top shooters of that stage or, or whatever, maybe I put a lot of time in watching those guys on the range, though, for sure. I think Dave Savigny might have been one of our first guys to really start rolling through positions like that. Yeah, I mean, th- Dave is Dave is one of those guys that's so accurate, you know, and if if he keeps that accuracy up and keeps his feet moving, he's he's hard to beat in any division. And you're absolutely right. He he does he's got like this hybrid. It's not really moving and shooting. It's just never stopping. I mean, that is yeah. moving and shooting, but it's not with steps. It's with just right. rolling through Center a position with his body weight. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to watch a video of Chris shooting a stage. So take a look. All right, Chris, why don't you, we never really had you introduce yourself. Why don't you do a little general introduction? <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, so guys, my name is Chris Tilly. Um, see, I was born in 85. I've uh, lived in North Carolina my whole life. Um, we, as far as um, the Tilly family, we're in the shooting industry uh, for small gun shop and, and uh, indoor shooting range. We have an outdoor facility as well in North Carolina. And as far as my, my passion in this is being able to make enough money to survive and shoot matches and, and get better and better as much as I can. So that's pretty much me. So I had a class set up. It was a couple of years ago in North Carolina and we lost our range. I don't know. I don't remember what happened. The range shut down or something like that. And I had these 12 people paid and ready to go to take the class mm. and nowhere to put them. So I gave you a call and you're like, yeah, come and use my range. And it was just so cool. And it was a great setup. I loved how it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. So we didn't have all these looky loos coming in and it was very private. It was great. Good. I like to hear that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're definitely different. We don't, I didn't set up a range necessarily uh, anything business-wise on it. It was actually for my training and to do matches. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, local level one matches is just, it's scored practice, right? And that's, that's why I made this range was for me to have more scored practice, you know, instead of traveling two hours to a range that, you know, was run by a bunch of people that don't shoot. I made my own range. That's only about shooting. So it's not about, you know, not shooting into the ground or this berm over here. Cause it's not going to look, look good or whatever. It's, it's about doing it because it's the right thing to do to, to become a better responsible shooter for your sport, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, safety yeah yeah I mean it, but it's a lot of ranges that's that's the biggest problem I can't tell you how many memberships I've had at ranges where the people really feel like talking to them face to face that they're you know they're on your side and they're for you but at the same time they they don't really want people there that really shoot and you know that that spend a lot of time on the range shooting they, they won't they right. want a country club and a, and a place to hang out 
So I, that was, that's kind of, that was been my goal towards the outdoor range is make it something else. It's, it's a place that, you know, shooters go, not members. We don't have members there. It's, it's really about people that I know that, you know, if I walk down range and they're hanging on a load of gun, I know that everyone's going to be safe still that kind of, and you can't, you can't, there's not many people that you could do that. And there's not many places you can do that, but that was, that was the goal. And that's what I'm working towards right now is making it more about people that know what they're doing. It's, it's not about excluding the people that don't know what they're doing, but it's about making, making it where it's a, a different atmosphere for people that do know what they're doing. Okay. So if you don't know where Chris Tilly's range is, you don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much. <laughs> All right. So you've been teaching classes as well, correct? Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, I would say the, the last 10 years, uh, most of my classes that I've been teaching has been basic fundamentals, you know, that first step, uh, defensive, uh, concealed carry and such of that nature. Um, and I've, I've always done competitive classes, but honestly, I, I've always more enjoyed uh, traveling and, and doing the, the classes outside of the country. It, it just uh, it made a lot more sense for me to do that. And with COVID, I've started doing a lot more competition classes and, and training at my own, my own facility, not traveling, but, do, but doing it there. And I'm enjoying it. Uh, getting away from that beginner mindset that's so repetitive and doing more of, you know, what I, what I actually love doing. So it's, it's fun. I need to get back and in, in doing it more and more, but you know, that's, that's hopefully in, a, in another year or two years, I'll be able to do that a little bit more full-time than what I'm doing now, but it is, uh, it, it really is my passion. And I've got some, some plans, uh, like I said, in, in about may, maybe six months at the earliest, but probably a year um, we'll be having a lot more stuff uh, for people to join, look at and content for, people that are serious about getting better, getting better. So in these more okay. competitive based courses, what kinds of things are you focusing on teaching? So, you know, in, in group classes, the biggest thing without even really looking at the students and just having that course set up uh, itinerary, we, we really hit a lot of, a lot of key points uh, as far as where the low hanging fruit is. And for most people in that, it's not, it's not having a, you know, a one second draw versus having, you know, a right. 1.2 draw. It's really understanding how to play the game. So that's that's one of the one of the main classes that I set up for multi student is pretty much un understanding what does it mean to have, you know, uh, a five a five hit factor or a ten hit factor. So I, pretty much un oh, that's all good. You want me to pause on it? Yeah, give me one second. My my just let him in. It's a very dangerous person, Emma. You know, kid's yeah. front door. Mahal needs to protect, yeah. protect Kida. <laughs> yep. Cool, man. Are you gonna consider doing like the online stuff at all? Because you know, I see we, Eric's like started his entire like Eric Griffo Academy. So, I, so one thing you know, I, I worked with a guy and I was the main face of it and definitely the the only pocketbook of it uh, called Super Grand Chant that we were we were doing off of a quirky. Thing that was definitely different from the normal mainstream of what people would want to watch on, on purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did get a little far out there, but I let my guy go at it. You know, there's a couple of things I had to cut off of because it was too wacko, but we had a lot of plans for that. And honestly, to be honest, spent, spent all the money and I just had to shut the project down. I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't afford it anymore and still, still financially recovering from that, but yet we do, but it's going to be in a different way. It's going to be more simple. It's going to be selling memberships and such like that where people can go and access the, the, the videos and, and, you know, it, it's really more than anything about like getting Patreon, the game. basically. It, yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not going to be so much competition base. It's going to be a little bit more of, you know, really how I've been able to make a living uh, in my career is, is not off competition shooting because there's not enough of us, you know, yeah. I can, I can do five classes a day, every day of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, hundred dollar an hour classes for learning how to handle the gun safely and operate the gun and such of that. So there's definitely a market there for me in my area. Um, even, even at being online, there's a big market for people not wanting to go out right now with whether it be right, like right now, gas prices or COVID and just, just the hassle. Of, yeah. I mean, that, the hassle of going out, it's, I don't, I mean, maybe you all feel different, but you can't even go out and, and, and get a bite to eat with the family without it being harder now post COVID versus before how it was. So people just don't go out as much, yeah. you know, they've gotten used to that. So that's, that's kind of my thing there. I want to, I want to be away from the indoor range. I want to be outside more, you know, with my students. I want to be shooting with my students. I want to be practicing and training. That's, 
that's the goal. I, I really hadn't been able to get behind the gun and train myself in about really since 2015. And, and I really want to get back to that. That's like I said, that's my passion. The more that I learn about myself, the easier it is to teach as well. So, oh, you know, sure. it's, it's one of those things that if I'm really doing my job, you know, and, and practicing and, and training in the gym and, and, and really working the equipment, making sure everything's good to go, I can, I can pass that same information uh, along. So not only is it going to help me to be a better <laughs> shooter, obviously, and, and have better results for myself, but it's also going to help it and make it more easy to, to teach and, and get people where they want to be. Okay. So is your, your intention, is your intention to go to the world shoot at the end of the year? You know, it, it's something that my family and I were just talking about. We, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be the world shit we've come to know and love over, you know, since I've started this. Uh, You've done quite a few world shoots as well. Yeah. In your career. Well, I'll be honest with you, uh, Grant. 2002 South African world shoot was not only the best world shoot, it's the best match and the best everything. And it's honestly the reason I'm still doing this. Uh, you know, I'm going to take that it, as a sound bite and just send it to everyone in South Africa. <laughs> listen, everyone, if you live in South Africa and you've met me in person, you know, like I, just, I going to South Africa is, is, is this, it, it's underrated for it being the Mecca place for shooting. Cause it is, it's, it's, it's kind of where it was born. It's where there's a lot of history there. And, and if you go and shoot one of these matches, it, even if it's a level two match uh, or level, level one local match there, I mean, they put on some amazing events and just every camaraderie there, the competition there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's in my mind, it's, it's unlike any other place on any other region uh, for our sport. So it's, it's amazing. And, and it's, I can honestly say it's what's kept me and, and really gave me the passion to do this for as long as I have. Now, when you were shooting in South Africa, did you find any difference in the way the ROs ran the match than how they run them elsewhere? Honestly, yes. Um, and I, I would say it, at that time, there wasn't as much separation as there is now. But um, d professionalism, it wasn't about – there was really trying to, to separate the RO from the competitor – um, to, to be, it's, they, they're not there to be your friend. They're not there to help you out. They're there to score and make it fair for everybody. And I think they really separated that more, um, in, in Ipswich than they do in USPSA. And I, I don't, for whatever reason, I don't know what that is. And I could be, again, it could just be my own perception, but I, I would say that it's definitely a little bit more professional. Yeah. Yeah. Maria Gushina came on the show and she actually mentioned that when she shot in the U S she felt like the ROs were there to support her and help her. They weren't out to get you, to disqualify you. They were there to help you through whatever it was so nothing bad sure. would happen. Sure. You know, and there, don't get me wrong. I think that attitude is really good for beginners and really good for getting people going. Level one local match, absolutely. Everybody's there to help out. It doesn't really mean anything, right? There's no title on the line. There's, there's not, it's not going to change anything. You could say that about a little level two, but at least there's a title on the line. But there needs to be a separation also. Like, you know, I don't know how, I don't know where it starts and where it stops. And if, if you do a reload to your left being right-handed, you know, you're going to get every RO and, and everyone on there is going to be looking to DQ so yes. quick. And you, get, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it's one of those things that you come to expect that. And it's not that it's right or wrong. And listen, I, let's just put it this way. So you have, I would say in Ipswich, they're more willing to DQ, even if you, just because you came close, but you didn't, but those, mm. you're still DQ'd. In the US, it's like, well, it was safe. We're just going to let it go. And so I don't, I don't think, I, I think there's a good, good gray medium area there that is probably the best way to hit. But I, I think with this, how people are, you know, we're all human. I don't think, I, I think that's too hard to find. And in my opinion, I see, I would much rather be a separation of beginner shooters and professional shooters. It would, it would make it so much easier for me if it was, if it was to a point where we could start really promoting, you know, and getting commercials and, and advertisement more. And the, you're just, why would you do that with, you wouldn't, any other sport, you wouldn't do that, but the, the major leagues, we don't really have a major leagues. It's, it's not right. even, it's not even it makes it really hard for someone like me to spend so much time and money taken away from my family. That could be, you know, building a better, you know, financial, uh, you know, freedom for my family and, and savings for my kids and such like that. But 
you know, it's, it's really hard to make money in this sport. Everyone thinks that it's so easy and it's you, there's a lot of sacrifice and oh, yeah. a lot of it, a lot of it's my opinion is because of the organization, how it's run. It's this, you know, oh, it's, well, it's in a, you know, it's a volunteer sport. It's, it's this or that, all these excuses long day. It's, it, it's still about if, if you can entertain people and get people here and, and doing that with the higher end guys is much easier than doing it with the beginner people. I understand the intimidation factor in this and that, but they don't do it in hockey. They don't do it in baseball. They don't do it in basketball. They don't do it in any other sport. When you, when you see an advertisement, you see the best of the best. There's a reason for that. We're not, we're not figuring out something so special in, in USPSA. So that's, that's the biggest thing that I would like. I, I think that to have that as well, you're going to get more of these strict uh, or people, if you, if you will, looking like, for instance, in, in hockey, when you have a linesman or a ref, they're, they're, they are making some kind of judgment if it was, you know, to let it go or not. Don't get me wrong. But if you're off sides, it's either you're off sides or you're not. It's not about who you were or your intent. It's black and white. And, and if, if that comes off as being mean for ROs, I can understand that. But at the same time, I'd much rather have that. I'd much rather have somebody being, you know, in my opinion, mean because they disagree with me. We can disagree. That's fine. But it, it, it's just uh, I, this, I, I don't know, or feeling like it, when an RO says, I'll give you that. Well, you didn't give me that. I earned it. Right. shot you're scoring it. there's a difference there and i i just there's something there's something to that mentality i i definitely do think that in the u.s and, and international is completely different absolutely yeah i understand what you mean about the separation of ro's and competitors and i think that sure. does bring a level of prestige to the ipsc competitions for versus sure. uspsa yeah and what you were yeah. saying about um advertising, mainstream media. I think our biggest challenge there is people are, like you said, intimidated when they see firearms. So it's going to be really sure. tough for us to incorporate a shooting sport into mainstream media. And one of the things IPSC did that we did not do was change the targets to the classic targets where we have the metric with the little robot head and it looks more humanoid. Sure. Yep. And even our poppers yeah. have a little head on them. And apparently that's faux pas. Well, I mean, but, and you, you would agree. Yeah. We, they changed it in Ipsic, you know, to, to satisfy people. They didn't really hurt the shooters. Well, that, was a, that was more a European thing. Like, okay, well, we need to really get the sport in Europe. Let's make it as benign PC. as possible. Yeah. But I mean, the, the only thing I don't like about it again is, is kind of the politics behind it. Like I don't want to give up anything for something I don't agree with. Okay. So I would have never want to give up the heads. I'll be honest with you, it's a much better target, in my opinion. The classic target is 10 times better, not because of how yeah. it looks, because of how it is. Uh, the poppers don't matter. In fact, I think the heads are cooler because, you, you know, you could use a, a, I guess, do you call it a metric and classic popper? I don't even know what you call them, but you could use a non-head as, a, you know, as a, a notion. I think it's Colt use, Steel. Have, is, oh, you're right. The headless Colt one steel. is Colt Steel. Yeah, you're right on that. I mean, there, there's, there's something to, there's something to, um, there's something to it, but I don't think it was, was the targets more than anything. I, I, I really do believe that most of the people that are in charge of making the decisions for us, the shooters, are not shooters. And when you have people like that that are not – they're not the people that even knows what's going on, the most part of shooting the gun and what the whole sport is about is about shooting. It's about becoming a better shooter for all of us, You know, whether it's for defensive purposes, competitive, fun. It doesn't matter. It's still about shooting. So if you can keep everyone safe and you can make it – more entertaining for the competitors and spectators and make the shooting get pushed more and more and more where to compete, you have to get better. I mean, <clears throat> that's not what it's about. It's, I, I think it's actually the opposite. It's almost to make it where the people that don't shoot, you know, can come into it and feel better and getting people, more people that don't shoot that do it every now and then the it's growing the sports big, but again, we need to start catering towards, you know, making it about the shooting more, not about just getting, more people and more numbers it's about making better shooters in my opinion that's something interesting about that steel when i when i was teaching in new zealand i built a stage with two big poppers and two little poppers and they were double stacked and they mm. said that's against the rules you can't do that and i was like why really they said because it looks yeah. like a family oh my god so they that's made awesome. it against the rules to have a family of steel <laughs> Yeah, well, in in Ipsic, yeah, many many targets and full size targets can't be in the same array. I didn't know that. I learned that yeah. there. That was years ago now, but yeah, that 
that surprised me. So that's another thing they do to make it more PC. So you, you, you could have a popper and you could have a plate, have a mini popper and a full size popper. But as long as they're not in the same array, so as long as you can't right. see them from the same shooting position, you'll, you'll wow. be fine. I'm, I'm not too clear up on the rules though, in, in, in full disclosure. But Chris, how do you feel about having a, a th like in cricket where they have the third camera empire, like how would you feel about having that where, okay, well, there's a camera kind of faced in the front of the range watching the shooter because you can't get those cameras that follow movement sure. as someone's doing. So get that at a major match, not every like club shoot, but at sure. like a major match, like nationals, have that in the front of the of the bay, tracking the shooter. So if there is a question of, well, you broke the 90 <clears throat> or that, they can go to the third camera umpire. Oh, uh, listen, the, the dumbest thing is using old school, outdated rules like the video issue in the USPSA. I think Ipsic has it as well, where you can't use any kind of video as evidence of whatever. Um, but I love it. I think we need, I mean, what, we should have cameras on uh, cables. We should have drones in the air. We should have everything. Instant replays. Stable. Everything, if you want it. You know, we already have an iPad. Why not have one or two more clicks over. Now you can actually watch, watch it again. You can already have another shooter going on. And then you can bring that up, have the range master over there. That would be amazing. Now, we don't have, I don't think we have the budget for it. I mean, right. Uh, but the more, the more people seeing it, more cameras and the more, listen, the better off it's, I think everyone's going to be. How the, the only, the only thing about cameras and angles and such like that, that people worry about is, you know, oh, well, it looks like it broke the 180, but it didn't break the 180. Listen, all that stuff, I, I would still much rather have more cameras that maybe show something, an angle. It's, it's going to be, it's, it's, there's always going to be people that are unhappy with it. But the thing is, we got to, we have to progress in the spot of getting this more uh, modern. It, I mean, we're, yeah, it, more publicized, but just, I don't think we're going to get, we're going to get more publicized until we become more modern. I mean, guys, right. it wasn't that long ago until we still had to sign up, you know, by showing up at a level one local match and giving the guy cash and like writing down your name on a piece of paper. So, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're at least 20 years behind in the U S here anyway, on just signing up and shooting the match and getting scored. So we'll, we'll get there, but we, we need, we need to make sure we have this conversation with people that actually matter can get it done too. Well, I think another issue people worry about is guys like Mike who would argue every single call and say, Oh, look at the video, look at the video on every stage. And well, it, would I mean, slow, and it would slow down the whole match if every single person is doing that. Absolutely, but it already does. I mean, you, you have all these right. guys calling doubles and this and that, and, you, and, and it's always the same guys. The, the guys that don't do it are always the same guys unless they really believe in it, right? And then the right. guys that are always calling out are always the same guys. So one thing that, that, that might be nice uh, as far as on the scoring and such like that is, is truly getting out maybe who, who, who the shooter is and who scores. I don't know how they could do it, but maybe they don't know who that is. You know, and, and there maybe there's an appeal pro process right then and there as well. Yes, but maybe you only get a couple of them, or maybe you only get one a match. You know what I'm saying? So you can't always. And and here's the thing: let's say you only get one a match. You win it, you get it back. If you, if you use that one in the match and you lose it, it's done. You can't you can't use that for anything else. So if you don't agree with something, you it, it's going to really force those guys to you know if you only get one, and you got you got multiple stages left or the whole match left. You're, you're going to think twice before you pull out, uh, let's put an overlay out and let's use this, you know, one, one, I don't even know what you'd call it. Uh, one, uh, review, let's say, uh, of my own. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 We're going to be having, um, Matt Hopkins on the show in a couple of weeks here. And I think he's really passionate about getting our sport more publicized and modernized. I'm interested to hear what he has to say since he's running for USPSA president sure what his ideas are he's compared it to the bass fishing shows the competitive bass fishing and he says well why can't we do this well, yeah. i know a lot of it is again people are worried about having guns on tv and finding someone willing to host that but i think there are workarounds i mean you know what though? i mean you, huh? you, rumble you guys have so whatever. many new gun owners i mean like yep. there's an entire market of guys who like well, I have this gun, what do I do with it? Like, well, if Absolutely. they see something on a major network, they might just join you if they say, sure, they might not stay, but, you know, 10% of them, 20% of them is better than the 0% that if you weren't there, you know? 
Well, I mean, why, why does the USPSA not have their own internet TV? Right. That they could sell to, you know, me to have a station or a channel on that I have to pay money to every month that goes right into the members of whatever USPSA wants to spend it on. I mean, it's the, it's the dumbest thing ever. Also, with that being said, why would USPSA, I don't know, maybe, maybe they look at it as like, that's not their job. Maybe somebody on, right. on the private sector like me need to do that. But long story short, it, there, it needs to be backed by, by an organization, in my opinion, rather that they're going to back it by, you know, sponsoring it and, and, uh, and giving a good amount of money to be a part of it and mainly be about their organization, sport, whatever it may be, whether it's Three Gun. You know, I mean, look at Three Gun Nation. It, a, lot of, a lot of good ideas. It was just ran poorly, in my opinion. And, uh, but it, it, was, it was the right track. Um, it, it, I don't think that it's, we're too far gone that we can't get on, you know, TV and, and such of that nature. But I, I do think that I don't, I don't think we want to give them an opportunity. I mean, you can't even get a credit card company to, you know, to let me spend money with them to sell products that that's hard, you know, hardly out there. So we, I think we need to have our own, you know, TV station, whatever it may be, uh, live streaming, whatever it would, would be called. I, it doesn't matter, but I'm really surprised that no one's done that yet. I, w- I would do it. I would do it. You if can I get trap and skeep. To to do it. Yeah. You can get trap and skeep on like the, 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 like the sports um, channels and that, but and I'm not, no offense to anyone who shoots trap and skeep, but that is the most boring thing. Yeah. It in comes the right world on right after bowling. To watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, yeah. Well, ro- let's rather do IPSEC and USPSA in- instead of that. That would like be more interesting to watch. Something cool I saw in Hungary was a little timer sitting on top of the stages. So you could see the time people were getting and then the clock would stop when the timer would stop. So you could see their time for every shooter. Was it the okay. yellow one, the are you ready timers? No, this was this a long time ago. It was, it was just basically a stopwatch I got counting you. up and you know they used to do that when i first started and are you ready came out with that timer display especially uh Il- barry illinois had so many of them you could see everyone's time so when they're unloading shown clear it pop up there and you know what he just ran it in. i mean and it was entertaining especially for us watching the super squad and such it was very entertaining really seeing the guy shoot and then all of a sudden the time would pop up and it, it could be like, wow, he didn't look that quick. Or wow, he looked much quicker than that. You know, there, there was, it really brought up a lot of good talking points while you're waiting on the next shooter. And I, I, I don't know if you could do it live. That might be a little hard. It might be a little, you know, that bowling, you know, shotgun uh, kind of shooting. But it, I don't know. It's, it's better than what we have now, isn't it? Yeah, it would be tough to do it live and have the scores you know the but hits they, coming no, up live like those, those new those new timers they can link directly to practice scores so i mean it's not a jump to link it directly to a displayed timer on the stage that everyone can see i mean that's basically just bluetooth someone just needs to sure. write the code right yep that's true i feel like the points should have to be there too you've got the time you've got the hits any penalties or whatever and then the hit factor it, it and, should all be there on a screen I, I bet you, you know, with, with how it works with the tablet and stuff like that, I mean, but you get practice score, what's his, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, you get him together, you, Eugene up in, uh, I believe, Toronto, and you get the, the, the guys, whether you're talking about over in uh, Ukraine right now, I, I, I want to say is, the, is one of them, in, or the AMG guy, you get them to come up with something where, bam, right there, you have a hit factor, you have a time, alphas, you know, penalties, whatever it may be, and, and a hit factor on that, that'd be pretty incredible, and I don't think that would be that hard to do. And I, I get I, a club like mine anyway, that's that that would love to have something like that would definitely order them and and make a huge difference on, I think, the whole atmosphere of the range. Yeah. And then taking the guys who are neck and neck and saying this was one person's score. This is the other person's score. Sure. Maybe even adding a video like what you've done before, where you overlay one video on the other mm. and you can see the difference in how they ran it. There, Absolutely. there are a lot of things we could do. But yeah, funding yeah. definitely is the issue. Yeah, it's, it's a funding and a motivation issue, it seems, at the moment. Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of people motivated, but everyone that's motivated has to go out there and work and make a living. You know, we need somebody that's motivated, that's got enough money to do it. They don't care if they lose everything. And unfortunately, I'm not right. that guy. So, <laughs> right. But <laughs> most of us are not in that position. Yeah, unfortunately. So- Let's talk about shooting, like the actual shooting part of shooting. You just shot Florida Open, right? Yes, ma'am. 
I understand that was a very unusual match. You want to talk about it, that? It was a very, very hard match to shoot uh, and, and kind of know where the 180 was or wasn't. And because uh, it just, they had, I, I kind of, they had these targets set up where they were just kind of floating there where you could see it from multiple places, but there was also multiple places that you could see it was breaking the 180. And some of them were close and some weren't close at all. So it made, it was really hard. I don't know why this was for me. My little lizard brain, it was really hard to kind of figure out the tactics of the stage correctly. And I got caught so many times shooting the target flat-footed because I was so scared of where the 180 was. And then I'd see it, I'd see my video. I was like, oh my God. I was like, I had at least another, you know, step or two in me. I could have engaged that target. So it, it was a very strange match in that sense for me, mainly, it, you know, everyone talked about it being a wide open targets uh, and, and a hoser match. I would say it's, it wasn't that it was a hoser match or not. It was, it was the fact that there were so many options of, you know, you could really post up and shoot a lot of targets at one spot and have maybe you're transitioning over targets here and there, and, or you can move and shoot or uh, staying back versus running up there, there, there were, and those were good things, but, it, it was definitely not what we're used to seeing with, uh, with Shannon running, you know, with tight partials right. and, leans and, and all this more technical positions getting in and out of, it was a lot more free flowing and it, it was nice in one sense, but it was, there's was too much of it. It was too, you know, a, a match that you have to aim and, and technical in every position, every stage is fun as the competitor. And then, you know, a, a match where it's always hosing and, and running and moving and shooting isn't fun. You, you have to have a good mix of everything. And I, and I felt that they, they much of the same. Uh, there was one stage that was in the woods. I want to say it was stage four. And I literally, my, I, I took not one, one half step, like one foot moving, but both feet moving. I think I took two complete steps in the, in the whole stage. And uh, it was to, and to shoot 32 rounds. And that was, that was, a, that was very strange to me. That is very strange. It, it so, was very, very, I mean, a lot of high hit factors because of that. So another thing is, if you don't have partials, so there was no hard cover, there were no no shoots, no swingers, no movers. What was that? Steel. No steel. No, no steel at all in the entire match. No steel. Wow, that is really unusual. And when you take out those shooting challenges, I feel like it's harder to separate the wheat from the chaff because you don't really have Absolutely. an opportunity to really lay it down and show... I have this skill. This is what I can do because everyone's kind of doing the same thing. It, well, it, you're absolutely right. And one thing that was pretty interesting on, on it is everyone almost shot the same times. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a couple guys out there that might've been a little faster here or there, but what the only thing that separated someone in that match, you can go and look at the scores in a lot of ways and see it was the points. So there's a lot of guys that, you know, were kind of hanging in them that shouldn't have been and their points showed that, but their time showed, something different and and that where those guys normally if we had partials and a lot more gear changes of, of shooting and, and, and arrays and on the stage they're usually you know i'd say anywhere from seven to twelve percent off the pace scores, not the time but the scores total the time and points here they were the same on the on the times that you know so they were actually better than normal but their points actually suffered more than normal so it, it i'm not going to say it was it I'm not going to say it made it easier for someone to win or, or, or lose. It was just different. It, it was, it was a harder game to, to play the tactics of how you engage, uh, you know, targets. Like there, there's, there are certain targets there that I really wanted to uh, stop and the gun, maybe a little bit more slow down the gun a little bit more when, before I broke the shot and that match, you could, not if you did that, you're giving up too much, you're trading too much time for the points. So it, it was, it was, definitely outside of my comfort zone of, of how the match was testing versus how I've been practicing. And it was just that I, I think if now, if I would have trained for, it, I could have trained completely different and I think it'd been fine, but it was definitely a different match as far as the, Oh God, I don't even know 10 or 12 years past. I've never heard of a match with no partials, no steel, no movers. Me, yeah, me but neither. The, yeah, the, the, the problem with that is like, yeah, well, you, they did you, something new, you, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you allow, you allow like yeah. You know, there's one shooting challenge the entire match, the entire what twelve stages? How many stages was it? Ten stages. Ten stages. The entire ten stages appeals to one person, one type of shooter, and that's yes. You know that's that's wrong. It the point of IPSC, uh, the point of USPSA is 
to find the most well-rounded, balanced shooter that wins the match. The guy Absolutely. that can shoot fast and accurately, shoot you know tight partials, tight steel, tight targets accurately and fast. That's the goal. Not okay. Well, let's just throw this entire, throw an entire technical stage out, or throw an entire accuracy stage out, sure. or throw an entire. You know, that, that's wrong. That's not a good match in my in my book. No, it, it it wasn't a good match on being balanced at all. You're absolutely right. It, but what the whole I think the whole goal of the match was to get back to it being a fun match. Yes, a level two. Yes, it's a title match. But it was more about the start of the season. You know, a lot of a lot of Canadians uh, go to that match. You know, they haven't even touched their gun in you know five or six months. Uh, a lot of people from South America, at the end of their shooting summer, are, are coming up here to kind of to show what they've what they can bring to the table competing against the North American guys, and. What, one thing that's nice about that typically is the fact that you have coming together and with it being all field courses and uh, 32 rounds, every stage as well, it typically is a fun match. But as far as if you're really trying to win it and you're trying to be competitive in it, it's very stressful because it, it, let's say that's not like you're, whoever you're competing against is, is better at that moving and shooting or hosing or whatever it may be. You're, there's no way you're going to win unless he makes a mistake. So when it's more balanced, now your strengths are going to get shown and you're going to get points over them. And then their strengths are going to, that's, you're absolutely right. I, I feel that it does need to be more balanced, but I don't, I think that that match is not, and I could be wrong as far as this, but I don't think that the, the people that put the match on Frank and I can't remember the new guy's name there. I think that they, it's truly to be a fun match, more of an entertainment than a competition. And I, I think that's what they actually went for. And I, I do think they got it. I just don't know if it's more my cup of tea or not. I would say I, I'm kind of an Ipsit guy, the three, two, one, more technical. Right. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you prefer yeah. the three, two, one kind of format? Because USPSA is very like, you'll have like five yes. or six, like 32 round stages in an entire 10 round, 10 stage match. I would say that USPSA gets a lot of people that complain about more Ipsic three, two, one format. They, USPSA guys in the US, or I should say guys in the East Coast, especially when you get an Area 8, they don't like it. So there's a Area 8 was trying to become more 3 2 1 like. Ipsic format, and they got in trouble on that. They really did. So, what was the shortest course you had at Florida Open? Every course was 32 rounds, 106 points. Every single what? course was 32 <laughs> rounds. So, it was, it was a 10 stage match, 320 rounds minimum. <laughs> wow. So nuts. That is. Yep. But that's <laughs> not, jaws okay. on the floor. <laughs> if they wanted, okay, well, if they wanted to make something fun, I mean, <clears throat> I think the short courses are more fun because everyone, you know, you get to shoot it sooner. Everyone, you know, you it, you don't have to necessarily create a stage plan because you're sure. standing in a box. That is that is a more fun kind of way to look at it. But every single thirty two, yeah, that that's not. I don't think that's fun. Honestly, yeah, and then keeping your stage plan straight for all 32 round courses without that any must short have been courses difficult. mixed in to give you a mental break. There is no you mental know, break there. No, there, there, there's no mental break there, but it's at the same time, they, I, I think they did do a good job of keeping the stages fairly simple because, and I, I think that's why they didn't have the movers okay. in there more than anything is for setup and to keep it more simple in a way. Now, with that being said, if you're going to have you know, 10 field courses for me, you know, I, I really, there's no reason that I shouldn't come from that match of 10 rounds, unless I just shoot absolutely spectacular. I, I, I should have some hard shots in that match as far as like, okay, I've got to, I got to pull, you know, a little bit of marksmanship together here to make this shot like I want to, to you know, to not shoot too Charlie on this target or a Charlie Del whatever it may be. And, you know, I think a lot of the top guys, until you start getting swingers or, you know, headshots at 25 yards or, or you know, whatever it may be, it, you're not you're not getting those shots and there wasn't a single shot in the match that I felt like that was really pushing me on the marksmanship side at all because there were no plates because there were no steel no swingers and such so okay, I didn't so was it that. was it the type of match sorry, sorry it was the type of match that like the first three stages dictated who the winners and who in the middle was going to be and that's kind of how it stayed it kind of, in, in a way you you could you could separate I would say not the winner but maybe two or three guys on who's going to be uh, maybe first or second, maybe third, and then the next the next tier down and the next tier. It it, it was really a funny match because uh, I can't believe how many misses and deltas were shot in the match for how easy the shots were just because everybody was trading time for points to the point where it, it got crazy. But the overall, the overall winner of the match did a really good job as far as 
time he traded points for time, he really, really got – He at worst case scenario, he was even, you know, from where he should have been, in my opinion, or he actually even came out. And that that kind of strategy doesn't work on most matches. You, you know, the right. points have to come first and then the time. So that was that was the most unique thing on the competition competitive standpoint, in, in my opinion. Now, I have yeah. a technical question for you. I've asked other guys this too. What size is the spot that you look for – on let's say an open target at 10 yards? You know, I, I try to really be visual about the target to the point where I, I'm looking for, like, it, 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 for instance, it, it, that's that's a pretty loaded question. So to, to try to simplify it as much as possible, like on USPSA, I almost never stop my gun on any target. The gun's always slowing down or pausing, but it's never stopping. And, you know, it, depending on, on, on that, that distance target and being full size. What distance did you say? 10 yards. 10 yards. So the gun's definitely, you know, let's say I'm transitioning right to left. So I'll actually, I'll probably try to break that shot right at the the right alpha Charlie line as the gun's slowing down, but still moving to the left, break a shot there. And, and the next shot, I'll probably almost have paused the gun as well for the follow-up shot as well. And, and what I'm looking for there depending on where the gun's coming from. So if the gun's coming down to the alpha, I'm going to be at the top right. If the gun's coming mm-hmm. directly to uh, the, the right to left, I'll be in the, in the middle of the alpha, but I'm trying to find my spot. Like when I'm breaking the shot, if I'm looking for the middle of the alpha there, I'll watch you, my eyes will be on the middle of the alpha, but I'll watch you, my peripheral vision, see the sights, whether it's iron sights or a dot, it doesn't matter. Breaking the shot on the alpha, try the line. And then the, the transition will bring it to where I want it. And as far as the follow-up shot, I'm looking for the center of the alpha uh and hopefully nothing on the left side of that for the follow-up shot so i'm almost using the recoil of the gun to kind of pause the gun up and lighten the gun up for the follow-up shot if that makes sense yeah i so in my next book that's coming out it's train smart self-coaching for practical shooting i -hmm. talk about how two perfect center hits are not perfect hits Sure. It should be uh, as you're transitioning on and then coming back down out of recoil. If they're right next to each other, that means you could have been faster. Sure, so you're, absolutely. You're finding your area on the target to look at, and it's not telling you where you're going to shoot. It's telling you when you can shoot. When, this is when how soon I can break the shot. Exactly, exactly. So everybody's gun recoils up. You know, some guns, like, for instance, everybody's gun that's right hand that kicks a little bit to the right, just the ergonomics of how the energy goes through you into the ground. So also how the gun's transitioning, if you're transitioning to the left, it's going to help make that gun track straight up more, more up and down if you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's hurting. But you're absolutely right. So, for instance, the first shot can be pretty close as far as elevation-wise of where you want it. But the second shot, you should be really take advantage of the very big top of the alpha because the sight's coming back down. Well, when it comes back down, it passes the top of the alpha before <clears> the you know where that first shot should have been. So you're absolutely right. You're looking for a different – placement on the first shot versus the follow-up shot at the top there I, I would say that for most people what they get caught up to when they start getting those perfect uh you know paired um pairings like that is they get used to this timing of what the gun's doing and, and it's definitely a uh it, it's the timing of the fact that they're only re- they're confirming the visual but they're only shooting off of the physical or audible noise of the gun and the distance of the target from what they visually see they're not right. really shooting on the visual of I can shoot now, pull the trigger. It's it's more, it's more of that double tap, you know, versus a controlled pair, if you will, or or however you want to call it. But you're absolutely right. It's it's like for for instance, is it easier to shoot a three yard target that's you know at waist high, or is it easier to shoot a target that's at three yard that's at shoulder high? If you know the lower target, if if you're if you're if you're throwing the gun, the gun doesn't have to move as much because the gun's low. The, the target from, from off your holster is almost the, the same height, right? So the gun's getting pushed out, nothing up to the target. And same right. thing, that tall target at your shoulder, you, why would you be shooting in the center of the alpha? You need to be shooting at the bottom of the alpha because that's what appears first. You're at, yeah, you're spot on with that. Yeah, I love getting into the nitty gritty of all this vision training stuff. I nerd out on that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you have some sponsors you'd like to talk about. Yes, you shoot for yeah. Bull Armory, don't you, Chris? Yeah, so uh, let's see, 2019 started getting in with, with Bull Armory, and 2020 was the first year, obviously, with uh, with COVID and such. You know, COVID's really held us back as far as getting a lot of R&D and testing, and that's kind of the phase that we're still stuck in with me personally. 
um, with, with the equipment that I'm using. Uh, right now, uh, I'm really liking everything that I'm seeing with them as far as the price point, the quality, and, and how they're, they're holding up. I think that uh, I, I think that they're going to end up being if they stick in with this game for a good while. I think they're going to be really hard to beat. And I, I think even game changing as far as getting people into a division like Open, you know, you, you're, you'll be able to buy a gun that's less than half the price that's going to be competitive enough, which is pretty incredible for an Open shooter. And that's that really is my passion that division. I, I shoot other divisions, but <clears throat> I really don't want to. You know, I like Iron Sights. Um, so because there's a dot that's invented. It's just, it's, it's not as much fun to me. I mean, I shoot both of them still, even in training today. Uh, but it's, it's just not, uh, not where my passion is as far as, you know, uh, holsters and such like that. Something I, I recently switched. I'm actually, uh, shooting for Guga Rebus right now and, uh, really like all the stuff that, that they're doing as far as how adjustable the holster is. There's so many things that you can do to the holster. It's, it's un unlike anything else that I've ever worked with. And, uh, mainly, mainly, is the biggest change that I've been doing. I, I did some blue bullets and such like that, and, I, and I've been still shooting them with the, the polymer coating. And, you know, in open, you can get away with it. Um, but what they really shine is in production and limited, the accuracy and, and such, uh, and, and how awesome it does to not wearing your gun out. It's incredible. So you can, yeah. you can shoot 120,000 rounds of blue bullet to a, a nine, and it's like shooting 10,000 jack of the crew. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. But, you yeah, know- they make great bullets. The, the, the COVID has really ruined everything for getting and, and selling and such, you know, like even Shooter's World Powder, the best, the best powder for the price for open by far is, is Major Pistol. I love it, but you can't get it. It's just the supply of it's no good. I think also the stuff that's happening in, uh, in Ukraine and such is not going to help it uh, for the summer. Uh, primers, yeah. as everyone knows, has, has gotten crazy. Um, but you know, I, I think out of everybody that's, that's done it, one of the one of the better sponsors for the not not just for me and uh, but for the industry has been uh, uh, Hunter HD Gold as well. They oh, every yeah. match that the way that they just support everything, and I say they, I mean it, it is Brian that's there, but it's a whole team that he has there that's mm -hmm. it's pretty incredible. I've never seen anything like that since I've been doing this, um, and I, I I really I think there's something to be said of that. We need more guys like that. I think. Brian might be one of those guys that ends up putting together like a, you know, an online TV station for right. you know, the shooting sports. You know, I, that's who I see kind of doing something like that. But yeah. He did start doing a radio podcast. Did he? Oh yeah. He had, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I do so much shooting when I'm done with the range and done teaching and or practicing or reloading or whatever it may be. Last thing I, I want to do is be on the range or talk about shooting. So I, I don't do very <laughs> many podcasts. I mean, most, most of the podcasts or the gossip uh, from me comes from either uh, students or stuff that have to match with other competitors. So I don't, I really don't watch much of that, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it. Well, we very much appreciate you coming on. Yes, <laughs> Thank awesome you for having talking me. with you. One last question before you go. I, everyone <laughs> has a one year goal. It's easy, but you've been in the sport for so long, for so many years. Do you find yourself making like a five year goal, for instance? Well, it, it, it's kind of funny that you said that. I mean, so my, my big goal, it's been longer than five years and I'm still on it. Ho hopefully this year, I'm definitely, I'm definitely on, on track and, and a little ahead of the schedule of being completely uh, free of anything but the competition shooting. It's something that I've really been working on hard. It's uh, taken a toll on, on my own shooting, but I'm hoping to, to get away from everything else and be able to practice my number one goal it's not even a shooting goal it's to be able to shoot goal and then if, if i can get that done uh, hopefully at the beginning of this summer so not too far off from there hopefully hopefully in about three four months um but uh as far as shooting wise for me honestly my, my biggest issue that i've got to take take away from this is uh i i, I like me mechanical things and messing with the guns i want to get comfortable enough with equipment that is so reliable and so easy to shoot as far as uh I, I do it every single day that it's even even if there's another gun that can shoot better or whatever it may be it doesn't matter it's just knowing knowing the game uh, that i and 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 my and, and my strategy is even even if it might not be the best but i'm going to stick to the plan and to be able to for me to be able to do that i've got to do a lot of practice I, i've got to be able to you know not only shoot the gun but i got to be able to sit, sit down and visually think about it and and, and get 
all my ducks in a row. And that's really my goal. It's not, it's not to beat anybody. It's, it's, it's to be the best shooter that I can be personally. And I, I hadn't just the fact of me talking about, it, I'm getting excited right now, just to, just to be able to have the opportunity and time to do that would make me very, very happy. And I could do that every year, five years in a row, 10 years in a row. I hope to be like Rob one day out there still winning nationals at, you know, 800 years old. <laughs> <laughs> <Or Rob. laughs> I don't think people realize how much it takes away from your own shooting. When you start doing things like running a range, putting on matches, coaching, yeah. it makes it really tough to put in the time for yourself when you're putting it into everyone else. It, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, everyone kept telling me, no, you know, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. It's, it's stupid. Whatever, you know, whatever it was to do with the shooting sport, not enough money. It's a waste of time. You know, and I, I, I really am one of those people that I, I wasn't able to do it full time, but slowly I started doing you know, little things, starting, you know, with the training, starting with the, the matches, starting with all this, all this background to, to actually be able to have an income and do this full time. And that's, that really is something I want to do. I did, I almost went into the AMU when I was younger and, uh, you know, I still have regrets for not going in the AMU in an aspect, but I didn't want to go in off of someone else. I didn't want my dad to do this, you know, for me full, obviously, first of all, I didn't have the financial income to, uh, pay for this, how much it costs, but I, I wanted, I, I need, it was important for me to, for it to all support itself. And that's, I, I always thought it was possible and I'm so close to having it there for me. And I, I think, I think for, for me, that's the goal is to be able to not only become a better shooter and be able to practice more and come up with more, but just the fact of that I'm not in any other industry. And I, I to take it even further, I don't even want to be in the beginner market of the industry of and, and, uh, and sell Glocks. You know, I, I want to be full time in the competitive market. And I think there is a way of doing it. And it's just, uh, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. And I'm, I'll, I'll be there soon enough, I hope. And uh, to, to make it full time competitive shooter, nothing, nothing more than that, but the industry that it has to offer. Yeah, I think we have the same kind of attitude where we've probably both had a lot of people telling us, you can't do this, you can't do this. And we both just kind of said, watch sure. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and they were right. It's not the easiest. They were right. It's, it's not, not easy. There's definitely, there's definitely other things I could have done. I mean, man, the, the amount of money that my parents, I could have, I could have done a whole lot of stuff in schooling for the amount of money my parents spent on me to, to have the knowledge and the, the ability and travel to, to do all of what I did when I was younger, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's, it's, this sport has given me so much and it's incredible. So this it's is about the fulfillment. Yep. It's the fulfillment of it. And I'll tell you something else. My biggest fulfillment for me is going to be when I've made it where the next group of guys that's like me don't have the struggle like I had to do this and then just keep growing it, getting it bigger and bigger and bigger. That's kind of, that's what I want out of this for me. I, yes, I want to be the best shooter, but that's my own personal. As far as something bigger than me for, that I want the sport to be, that I want to help get towards, we got to get this, these guys that put their heart and soul out there to become better shooters and spend every second they can thinking about it. They don't need to, they don't need to have it so hard. I, I hope, I hope that whatever that may be, it's, it, there's some groundwork that's put in making it easier for them to be a professional athlete in the shooting sports. So that's the goal. Well, that, and also instructors, I think we are sort of paving the way for new instructors coming in. And if we can lay some groundwork for them, maybe they won't have to struggle as much as we have. Yeah. I mean, you, the, the instructors, I don't have so much uh, pity for, because like you said, you listen, YouTube and the, and, and this, all the free information that's out there. I, it, there's things that I I had spent so many hours and thousands of dollars on. Now people can get if they're halfway, you know, uh smart right they're 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 gonna be able to get it and you know maybe a weekend right. with no money at all in it so there's there's and that's I guess I'm not just showing my age. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's not that it's not fair it's it's just it is what it is and it's it's, it's pretty incredible time. seeing it yeah and and I'll be honest with you even and, and you know this you you could tell everyone all the information you know, and uh, on on a video conference or, or just a video that they're seeing but there, there's still something there to someone being there to, to guide, mm -hmm. put their hands on you and, and show you smaller details. Yeah, you heard the words, but now you actually need to know the meaning. And without having someone there, you can't, it's, it's very hard to translate that information. So it's- There's only it so much you can learn already. online. You need it the is. feedback, that immediate you, feedback. You do, and, and, and because you know how hard it is. Some, there's some things that everyone can know how to do it. 
and they can't, they still can't do it. So there's going to, there's definitely going to be some of those there that only having someone there is going to be what, what throws you over that edge for sure. But even that, even at that aspect, there's so many people in our sport that if they don't get it right then and there, it's like, Oh, I can't get it there. It's like, all right, there's a process. There's a time process. You've got to, you got to be doing this for the next six months. Some people like that. Even, I can't even, that even comprehend. I mean, this, there's some of this stuff that takes a lot of time. You can understand it in and out all you want, but to actually execute it on demand, like you need to in competition, it takes a lot of time. And that's, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that aren't willing to put that time into it. So we'll see. I think it's almost gotten the information is almost too quick now versus how, how long people have been in the game. I, I think there's an imbalance there. Honestly. Yeah. So is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to mention? Hmm. Oh, one thing. Um, so throw a little bit of advertising my way. We're doing a Carolina Reaper match in, in May. Uh, this is our first uh, level two and uh, that we're, we're actually getting, getting done. And uh, hopefully of how it looks right now, you should be able to come and shoot 12, 12 stages and uh, not pace, not do anything, but just shoot. Ooh, so what, nice. What day, yeah. what day in May? It's going to be the last week in May. I want to say it's May. It's 27th, 28th, I believe last uh, uh, Saturday and 20. Sunday. 28th, 29th of May. Oh, sorry. 27th is when it starts. 27th is Friday. You can shoot all day Friday. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday, half days. Cool. Grant just planning a trip to the U.S., so he's looking into matches. Yes, I need to shoot all the matches. Because I want to I want to run outside the lines, because that's just going to be awesome. Oh, my. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> but, I mean, one, one thing, Grant, if you come up and shoot it, one thing I guarantee you, um, the level, all of our level one matches, people talk about how hard our match is. And what's funny is similar to what y'all shoot every week in South Africa, the technical, the plates, they, they call my plates four inch plates. They're, they're square plates. So they're the, uh, what is it? What is a square plate? It's got to be not eight. Eight is round. So it's six inch square plate. So those six, six inch square plates, you'd be amazed in how it just crushes people. Swingers mm -hmm. and such. We have, we have swingers on, on at least one swinger on every stage, some kind of mover. We do speed shoots and a lot of medium courses and people in the U S man, they, it, it's, they, they get eat up by it. You, you'd see guys that go to all these other matches that never have penalties. They'll come to my match and on eight stage local match, will have 10 or 15 penalties, you know, and it's, they, it, they don't blame themselves for sucking. They blame me for having the match too hard. It's like, guys, y'all don't, don't even know. Y'all don't even know. So, oh, at the last at, at the last nationals, we had, we had the, the mini steel plates on one array and then a swinging steel plate on another array that the swing it was 18 yards away swing and steel plate so it's like that's normal yeah and then they'll I guess. put it only at the height so you can't even you don't even have a dwell yeah yeah you, you basically only get it it's like only on the top little... apex <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean that's that's those are shots that those are shots that honestly, the re like I was telling you before, the reason that we created this this club uh, NC thirty eight that that is mine. Couldn't go and get practice from these other clubs that had stuff like that. We have swinging plates at my range. We shoot them every week. You know, it's it's something that it, to go to these local matches to even get a swinger that's actually instead of just having a swinger and having it where the one barrel is keeping it from you seeing it when it's rested. No, we do we do top exposed, side exposed. We do double swingers. I mean. Because at the end of the day, if I'm going to set up all this time and spend all this money to have this range and set this level one that actually make no money and cost me money and time, it needs to be good training for me. And that's the goal. If, if it's not good training for me, I'm not going to set it up. I'm not going to run it. So the match, the Carolina Reaper will not be too hard. It'll be just hard enough to make it where you know, you know, if, 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 let's just put it this way. You're not going to beat anyone by accident at the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> you're going to do it because you're on. <laughs> good. Awesome. That's well, thank great. you so much for coming on, Chris. We appreciate it. Was a it. pleasure. Guys, thank you for keeping me in mind. Y'all be safe out there. Yeah. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Chris. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. Bye.